I'm, I'm 70 years old and I can admit it now, you know, I was a mama's boy, you know, and my mother protected me. <laughs> you know, my mother did not want me to be not only in the Panther Party, she didn't want me to be a politician. So, but because of the publicity that went along with describing the Black Panther Party uh, and not knowing the ins and outs the, and the political agenda of the system at that time of J. Edgar Hoover and others, you know, my mother thought that I would, you know, see my death at that time. In fact, she was told by several individuals that that would happen, uh, that I would die. When it comes to contemplating matters of life and death, due to an uh, inescapable phenomenon known as cause and effect, I feel compelled to reveal a bit of history and context in regard to my interest in producing this project. It was the summer of 1976. I had just graduated from Tech High in Des Moines and was headed off to the University of Iowa in the fall when I ran across the woman I loved with another man. She was a few years older than I and so was he, which turned out to be a good thing because I was young dumb and I instantly lost it. I mean my jealousy monster took full control and if he had responded in kind it would have gotten ugly. So things were about to go far left real fast when uh, he just calmly looked at her and said you know you're lucky you're dealing with two brothers who are smart enough to deal with this situation like the intelligent men they both are. <laughs> I thought, what? How dare he? I mean, this, this, this joker just gave me a damn compliment. I'm ready to fight, damn it. But what he did was he implied that I was smart and intelligent, which was two things that I was definitely not exhibiting at the time. So we talked it out because, I mean, you know, who was I to prove him wrong? Now, in the aftermath, I have often thought back on that night over the years and felt blessed that due to his quick de-escalation tactic, I dodged a proverbial bullet that night. And my respect for that brother has only increased over the years. Instead of becoming a crime statistic, I became a filmmaker and college professor while he now makes laws in the Iowa legislature. Being a state legislator was very emotional for me because you're, you're, you're talking to an individual that was told would not see his 20th birthday. And now, here I am, and it was actually, actually 16 years ago that I was sworn in as a state legislator. Now understand, this is an individual that got kicked off of a riverboat where I was working on, got kicked off because I couldn't pass the Secret Service security check because Lady Bird Johnson came to ride the boat. And they kicked me off of the boat because I, they said I was a threat. And now I have been to the White House several times, been among several presidents, several candidates of presidents, and have served now as a state legislator. And people ask me, what is one of the memorable moments that I have? And the most memorable moment I had, I, I walked in that building, the Capitol, and I, don't, I was so excited, man. I, oh, man, I just, you know, I like a kid. 
You know, because I said, we're going to change these laws and, you know, we're going to, you know, stand up and we're going to fight from inside and we're going to fight with the community. And, and now, 16 years later, from 2007, walking in here, it's so disheartening. Because when I first got there, we worked together, Republicans and Democrats. We didn't agree, but we worked on those things that would make Iowa better. We worked through mistrust. We dealt with some real conversation. And then in 2010, we started going backwards. And then we look at 2016, we just went down a path that sent everything back to the rears. And that's sad for Iowa because Iowa was the first state to desegregate the schools before Brown versus the Board of Education. We were the first state to put in our laws and constitution that no man could be held as property. We were the state that African-American soldiers were trained to go into battle. We were the state that actually trained white women officers to be in the military. We have a history that now seems like doesn't mean anything to people, to the powers to be. And that's because when last, last session before this one, when we had the George Floyd situation happen, we passed a bill here, first in the country, called the More Perfect Union. Representative Rob Smith started working on it. We then came together, Republicans and Democrats and the governor, we all worked together you know, we had the Democrat leadership and, re and Republican le leadership working with them, and we crafted that bill, was passed unanimously in the Senate and the House that dealt with the chokehold, that dealt with officers, that they themselves, if they were found guilty, that they couldn't leave Des Moines and join the police, start, police force in Altoona or somewhere else. You know, we, we dealt with the issues that plagued the black community and people of color. We just knew we we're now, the pendulum was getting ready to swing the, the right way and dealing with social justice and you know, de dealing with you know, the, the disparities and we were all ready to go. This last session, it was like we got on a roller coaster, a perpetual roller coaster that was on steroids, going backwards. We passed a back to blue legislation that was a slap in the face to everything that we passed with a more perfect union. A bill passed, I didn't say, shouldn't say we, because we, it was on party lines, we voted against it. Then we passed a bill called 802 that penalized individuals for teaching history now understand, 1968, we're fighting for history to be taught. 2021, a law is being passed not to teach history in school. Saying that, you know, <laughs> that it, it degraded America. So if an individual used the term racism, used the term white privilege, used the different terms that if they were funded by the state, they would be in jeopardy of taking away those state funds if they taught that. Those are the things that we have to deal with. As a legislator, I've been there 16 years. I have other colleagues that have been there much longer than I have who said this is the worst they've ever seen it. The worst. And it's the worst for Iowa.
Des Moines was really hot at that time. There was a lot of anger. There were, uh, I don't know if that was in connection with the thing that happened at uh, Goods Park. My understanding was at Goods Park, they um, were having a meeting or having a, a, an event to talk about racial injustice and things like that. And it ended up where they were being chased by the police, you know. Um, and all that was happening at the same time in, what, 67, 68, 69. But the Black Panthers, I thought they did good stuff. I saw the Black Panther movement, you know, firsthand. I mean, I'm, I'm, I wasn't a kid when, they, when it came along. They, along with the church and along with every other kind, NAACP, all of those movements were a plea to follow the Constitution. One nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The Black Panthers actually came to Des Moines almost 50 years ago. And I was a youngster, you know, in high school at the time, and we had actually started, you know, the, a Black Student Union. At that time, uh, her name was Mary Smith, who later changed her name to Harasha Maryam, was on the West Coast. And she was introduced to the Black Panther Party. So you're looking about probably into 1966, 1967, she came back to Des Moines and actually then introduced the Black Panther Party to individuals in Des Moines. Now they're looking at it like they were uh, seditionists. They were trying to overturn the government. These are all kinds of things that were not true. Being a youngster myself, uh, I think I was 16 and a half years old, and I was looking. But as I learned about the party, and we were dealing with the situation, the racism of the time, the blight in our own community, I liked the fact that they started programs like the free breakfast program, you know, free clothing program, the clinics. But I, I think what attracted me the most with the Panther Party coming to Des Moines, Iowa, the Midwest, was when, you know, they talked about self-determination, that we, we needed to own our own. It was always a, 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 a fight that was a fight for what was right and a, and a fight that was a good fight, a good fight. It wasn't a fight of, for faith, but it was a fight through faith and with faith for equal rights. You can't have civil rights if you don't have human rights. If you're not looked at as a human being, what, what civil rights are you gonna have? You don't give someone who isn't looked at as a human being civil rights. I was 10 years old in 1968, and one night we were all over at my Aunt Maxine's house on 17th Street off Forest Avenue watching television, when suddenly there was this tremendous boom, and the whole house just shook, and the lights flashed off and on, and we all you know, looked at each other like, you know, what, what, what was that? What's going on? And a few minutes later, my cousin Michael rushed in from outside and told us that they had just blown up the Black Panthers headquarters, which was this, this white two-story house that sat catty corner across the street, a couple houses down. And he said that the Panthers all staggered out covered in this white ash looking like ghosts. But fortunately, God was good and no one was seriously injured or killed. But the bombers did kill something that night because before then, when I got old enough, I was going to be a Black Panther. But after that, mm -mm. my 10-year-old mind did not want to get blown up. For a lot of us, the impact of the Black Panther headquarters being blown up was a turning point. It was a turning point because up until that point, we never 
picked up guns. We never carried guns until after the bombing. And that was in 1969, and it was Drake Relay's weekend. And we were holding class. The, the thing with that, was, which was a blessing for us, was the fact that if class had not been late, and at that time, Charles Knox, who later changed his name to Mahmoud Abbas, he was our deputy minister of education. And he was late in preparing our lesson that night. So we were not actually in the classroom, which was in the basement of the Black Panther headquarters, that in the back, and there was only six of us that were there waiting for him to finish class, and then we would go and gather the other Panthers. There was uh, four of us that were downstairs at that, at that time. And Bill Fowler went upstairs to use the restroom, and down the hall from there was Mahmoud Abbas in his office preparing. And we were downstairs watching, and all of a sudden, there was this, like this flash. And we saw the flash, and then we heard a boom, and it knocked me back on a couch. But so happened was, we were all at the front of the basement structure of the building, rather than in the classroom. Because as you see pictures, it demolished the classroom. We all would have died that day if class had been on time. This interview would not be taking place. You know, we were there and Kalanzi Sadiq, you know, said, Brother Lieutenant, which was, I was a lieutenant at that time of the Panther Party, and he said, Brother Lieutenant, he said, where are we? And, you know, as I'm clean, wiping my eyes, all I seen was, it was the plaster but I thought it was clouds, you know, and I responded, I said, we're in heaven, you know, at that time. And, you know, we, you know, and then Gary Stroh, who was also there, he said, brother, what do we do now? I said, we find God and let's see if we can straighten this stuff up so black people don't have to suffer, you know, back, you know, on earth, you know, and we actually, you know, we're convinced that we were in heaven and we were going to have a conversation with God, you know. And so we gathered, you know, ourselves right there, the four of us, and the steps leading up to the side door, you know, we just looked at each other and we thought once we opened the door, you know, whatever, you know, we were walking around clouds and it was there. And so we got to the top of there and we all looked at each other and you know, gave each other a power sign because we were going to seriously go and confront God. You know, this was the Des Moines chapter of the Black Panther Party. You know, we were going to organize and we were ready to go. And, you know, at that time we knew uh, a friend of ours, little Bobby Hutton from, you know, California who had been killed. We were going to just meet with all the Panthers and, you know, we we're going to start a chapter in heaven. You know, I mean, that was truly the mindset we were in. So we pushed the door, swung it open, stepped out the door, and I turned around and looked down and said, no, we're still in hell. <laughs> yeah, because the house that was right next door, the whole side of that house was gone. And so we ran around to the front because we knew that Bill and Mahmoud were still in the building. And then there was a police officer that was on the porch. And he told us that we couldn't go in the building, and we told him we needed to get in the building because we had our comrades that were in the building. So he said, no, you're not allowed to. And we said, there may be another bomb. And that police officer looked us straight in the eye and said, you don't have to worry, there's not another one. You know? So that's how we felt that the police were involved with that bombing. And so Kalanji Siddiq, we came up on the porch, he picked up the officer very gently. I mean, did, picked him straight up, and he set him over the side of the banister. And we went in the building. You know, we pushed the door open, and Bill had come, was at the top of the steps standing. And he ran down the steps, out the door, and we didn't see Bill for a few months. You know, because it was a scary thought, 
And what was scary about that, to, to explain the devastation of that bomb, is that he has just, and to be graphic, he has just finished washing his hands and opened the bathroom door to come out when the bomb went off. And it was like one of those movies because when we got to the top of the step to get my move, we pushed the bathroom door open and there was nothing there. All the back of it was gone. From the top floor to the bottom, everything was gone. And we got Mahmoud, he was in his office. He was clinging basically to the edge of his office because it had blown his office. So we all walked out that night and got out of there, and we later found out that the bomb was so powerful, it like damaged, I think, about 30-something houses in the neighborhood, you know, blowing out windows and that type of thing. There was a, a bombing of the Black Panthers headquarters. I don't know if they ever said who actually did it years later after the bombings took place, was there was a newspaper called City View, did an interview with the chief of police back at that time. Now understand, this is, you're talking about 40 some years later. And I hadn't seen Chief Nichols in, in decades, but he was interviewed by the paper and I was interviewed by the paper and we were talking about the bombing of the Panther quarters and we are also, because two weeks later, at the bombing of the Panther quarters, you had three buildings that blew up, the police station, Chamber of Commerce building, and a building at Drake University. And at that time, Chief Nichols blamed us, the Panthers for blowing that up. The Black Panther Party here, we blamed the police department. Because as I stated, this, the police officer, the first one we saw coming out of the building was the police officer. So what we determined almost 40 years later that it was neither the police nor the Panthers, that there was a third party group that wanted to see us clash. And that was called the Minutemen, who talked about how the Panthers needed to be destroyed. And Chief Nichols in, his, in the interview, and he said he believed it was orchestrated for the police department and the Black Panther Party after those bombings to be able to come and actually destroy each other, but them destroying us because they had the power. They had the guns. And that was also because, you know, you, we got to understand that the Des Moines chapter of the Black Panther Party actually hit President Nixon's desk because of J. Edgar Hoover. Because in, in our Freedom of Information Act, we got that. And we're reading this now. You know, this isn't something we came up with. This is from the government. And Hoover actually said, the reason why one of the strongest uh, chapters of the Black Panthers was Des Moines, because we could not infiltrate the core group. We could not get anyone inside that core group. And they said the only way to stop the Panther Party in Des Moines was to kill him. And that was the seven individuals in leadership that led the party here. And so, you know, when you tie in this comprehensive plan to destroy, you know, as Cointel Pro was very evident, that the movement, you know, it comes out, you know, with that that hand, that invisible hand, at that time, as we called the government, you know, was there, you know, as we see, and still there. 